Hi, I gave this talk on November 14th, 2008 to Leadership Mendocino. Leadership Mendocino is a nonprofit organization in Mendocino County in California. And every year about 30 people from around the county meet and they explore the county, learning about how, how it functions, how it operates. And on November 14, 2008 was their Agricultural Day. And my talk followed the Ag Commissioner's talk on sort of the history of agriculture in Mendocino County. And I was supposed to talk about the future of agriculture in Mendocino County. So I came at this as a county historian speaking in 2020. So here's my talk. The Mendocino County food system, 10 years of dramatic change. Now, what I'm gonna do is I'm breaking this talk up into two parts. The first part is I'm gonna review the Little Death. This was a period between 2009 and 2010. And then I'm gonna talk about how we responded to that crisis and compare the agriculture and food system of 2009 to the one we have today in 2020. So, the key date in Mendocino County, everyone in the county remembers this, of course, is December 12th, 2009. And that was a day that it became obvious to everybody what our Achilles heel was. I'm not talking about Pepsi products, I'm talking about the trucking system. Let me explain how we got to this problem. Because this was the day, the last day that the truck showed up in our county. So what happened was that there, of course, was a crisis in the financial system that really took, uh, took hold in 2008. And this led to problems in the global shipping system. And so this, you started seeing articles popping up looking at how global trade was slowing down and then it really started plunging. And we started hearing news reports and seeing images mostly from uh, what we would call the third world or developing countries. And there was a lot of issues related to these countries having weak currencies and being reliant on importation of basic food and energy supplies. And so you had people saying, look, I'm trying to eat grass, the power outages, fuel shortages, um, money you know, becoming worthless. And so what we didn't realize was how quickly the problems we were seeing in these countries would hit our own neighborhoods. Now, the precipitating event that, that we think about is, uh, ha it was in Pakistan, of course, and that's a flag that everyone recognizes now. But um, this was just one of many countries at the time that we thought had all sorts of problems. But uh, basically, they were one of the countries whose financial system was collapsing, their currency was having problems, there were shortages of food, shortages of fuel, and riots started breaking out in the major cities, and Pakistan lost control politically, and lost control and, uh, of its nuclear, some of its nuclear weapons. So some of these went missing, and it was, it was, uh, they weren't discovered until it was too late, of course. And the Middle East was on fire. Fortunately, you know, ironically, fortunately, the, the exchange was contained within the region, but the effects were so dramatic because this is the area, of course, where most of the global oil supplies are, and almost immediately there was panic in, um, in, in energy markets. This is a super tanker that um, leaves, you know, the Persian Gulf, it takes six weeks to get to North America, and we knew that this was the last you know, set of super tankers on their way um, as soon as that, the, that nuclear exchange broke out. And that gave us kind of, this is how much time is left, really. And it wasn't, it wasn't enough time for us to prepare. So what's interesting, if you look back and you, you look at historic um, documents, reports, websites, just about everybody at this time period in 2008, 2009, understood the, the strategic importance of the Middle East for, for the lifeblood of the economies of the world, which was, you know, crude oil. And so these are graphs you could have pulled up on any website. You know, there's 16 and a half million barrels a day going out of the Strait of Hormuz. Um, and we also were keenly aware by this time, anyone who was paying attention, that the United States was extremely dependent upon these imports for, for 
basic functioning of our economy. And so there was a gap of about 75% between crude oil consumption um, and crude oil produ production domestically. So this was something that had been building since 1950. And um, we, we are started to pay attention to it, but hadn't really made a whole lot of progress in um, either closing that gap or closing our demand um, that required that, that gap to grow every year. So this is what we started seeing. We started seeing kind of an unraveling of the global uh, manufacturing um, and production and trade systems. <clears throat> so for example, uh, in China, you had trucks lining up to deliver parts and, and goods to factories, to ports, etc. And, and so there was sort of a domino effect where these sort of things unraveled. For example, um, this, these are the train cars of a single coal mine in uh, Wyoming, and 150 miles of coal trains have to leave that, uh, that mine every day to supply electricity to power plants in the Midwest. Well, when there wasn't enough diesel fuel available to run these coal trains at the same rate, suddenly now you have powder, power outages, electricity shortages, because of the loss of crude oil. Now, what's interesting, of course, is to historically look back at, at what was going on in Mendocino County prior to these incidents. This is a, a 2005 uh, table from a food security report from a, um, a, a local nonprofit called Willis Economic Localization, in which they, they asked the various supermarkets in Willits, you know, how many people a day do you serve? How many days of supply do you have in stock of the major foodstuffs on, our, on your shelves? And basically, it was, it was crystal clear that within about a week, the stores would be out of food. And that very little of the food that we actually consumed in Mendocino County came from farms or um, distributors that were in Mendocino County. We were totally reliant on the trucking industry to get the food there on practically a daily basis. So this was not just a problem for Mendocino County. This, had, this, this system of, of delivery by truck every day is called a just-in-time delivery system. And it had led to what you might call a warehouse on wheels. Warehousing has costs. And so with, with the trucking and shipping systems, essentially warehousing was diminished in, in, in importance, but the turnover, the, the rate of travel, had to, had to keep up for maintaining supplies of what people needed. So this had allowed, we, have, we had allowed sort of this just-in-time system to govern um, just about every aspect of our lives. So for example, the, the, uh, the world grain stocks in terms of days of consumption went down to levels prior to the pr crisis that had never been seen before. There was less than 60 days supply of food in things like grain silos. Now these were not government owned silos. These were, these were massive privately owned grain elevators. There was no incentive for them to stockpile stuff in case of emergency. Their job was to move it out. And so because of high grain prices preceding the crisis, supply, uh, grain elevators had been mostly you know, allowed to, go, to get very low. And um, this then le le left us totally ill-prepared um, on so many levels. Of course, I'm not saying that, that everyone was unprepared. There had been a movement for a food security movement um, a local food movement developing in the United States and other countries prior to the crisis. And so you had uh, a renewed interest in, in canning, in stocking pantries, in putting together um, stocks in the home or household scale of basic foodstuffs like whole grains and dry beans. People were putting in what you might call kitchen gardens or backyard gardens. Um, people were getting into solar cooking more. Because if you can imagine in an emergency situation, you may not have the cooking fuel electricity that you would normally rely on. So people were practicing these things. But the problem is that, of course, it hadn't reached a sort of a saturation level um, in, in, uh, in, uh, in North America. And it's, you know, 
it's really hard for us in this day and age to imagine how ill-prepared we were. After going through this crisis, we shifted so dramatically. So it's good to remind, um, remind us, you know, in 2020, what life was like in, you know, in 2009. What were people doing? Um, well, this is data from 2005, but it, it's pretty, pretty accurate even in 2009. The, United, the average home in the United States had a television on for about eight hours a day. And this was higher than other countries in the world. But in general, around the world, people were really engaged and engrossed in, in media consumption. And it wasn't just TV. You also had hours devoted to um, you know, personal uh, music players like the iPod, uh, computers and the internet, cell phones, etc. And this consumed vast hours, hours that were not spent then thinking about issues like where does your food come from. So back to how the crisis was on unfolding here. Um, the truck stopped December 12th. It doesn't take long. Within a couple weeks, people are quite scared because there's only so much food to go around. There's only so many people who are prepared. And um, it's not just a fear, of course. There's a, 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 people are reacting in a variety of ways. You know, they're hungry, and so they're scared. And some are more in a state of shock. Um, some are very angry. So it's interesting to, to think about how there's, a, there's a, just a, a diversity of responses to this. But in general, um, there was a lot of fear and a lot of hunger starting to feel. Because these, you know, this is not something that we have been accustomed to as a population preparing for or even considering that this is a possibility. And then from that point, um, sort of things ran their course. You can imagine the households that, I pre that had prepared for this are juxtaposed with households in a neighborhood that hadn't prepared. And so what, what happens you know, in, in communities when you have people with food right next to people without food? In some places, of course, there was looting. Um, but in places that held together, that understood this, there was a rationing system developed. There, there had to be sharing to maintain some social order and prevent looting from running out of control. And so um, people pulled together in some sensible ways. But as the crisis went on, of course, then very difficult decisions had to be made about who's going to get what. And so this is called the process of triage. And essentially, it came down to uh, if you could work, if you were you know, expending a lot of energy per day trying to keep things together, you got more. Now, you got to think, this is December 12th when the, when, the, when the trucks stopped showing up, 2009. Um, within a, a few weeks, people started asking questions that had been basically ignored for, for decades, um, like, well, geez, look at all this farmland out here. Can't we grow our, our food that we need? And the farmers have to respond, well, look, at, it's the middle of winter. Uh, we can't plant anything right now. We're going to have to wait until spring. And then um, it's going to be some months after we plant until things are ready to eat. Uh, furthermore, we are mostly hay ranchers here. Um, we, we have vineyards. We don't even have the equipment to do this kind of planting. You're looking for things like uh, beans and grains and potatoes, calorie crops. We don't have the equipment. We don't have the seed stock. So um, there was just sort of at a loss. No one really knew what to do. So this then went on for a while, and there was real uh, grief and disillusionment because you have now a situation where slow starvation is, is going on and people are kind of hunkered down. Um, there's not a lot of energy right now you know, left in everybody to, um, to get you know, violent or do much of anything. They're just kind of waiting for something to improve, for things to get better, and they weren't, and it went on and on. So there were then, of course, people trying to maintain, running around trying to maintain um, basic services. So for example, 
how do you keep water supplies running when the electricity system is now really spotty? Um, how do you keep the lights on in the hospital? How do you cook the little food that you have remaining? And what's interesting, uh, you know, the great irony is this, is that it was the liquid fuel stored in the gas stations, the underground tanks of the gas stations, that was used to run generators to pump out more liquid fuel to then take to generators to, say, keep the pumps going in the water treatment plant to some extent. So you, there was water and there was pressure in the water to run the generators at hospitals. And then there were cooking stations set up in many parts of the county where, you, you know, there wasn't, there wasn't pressure in the natural gas lines anymore. There wasn't enough electricity to turn on your, your uh, burners for cooking. So um, a lot of people got by by going to these sort of uh, community feeding stations. And they were, they were burning unleaded gasoline on, on uh, basically camping stoves and cooking up big, big vats of stuff. So we got some relief um, a little over three months after the truck stopped. Uh, FEMA started showing up finally. But you've got to you know, give them a break. This is something that's happening nationwide. And we're this little county. We have 90,000 people in the entire county. And they're dealing with problems in the big cities. So um, three months sounds like a lot. But uh, we, got, we got some relief. And, uh, and it, kind of, it kind of kept things at bay a little bit. It wasn't really enough, of course. We, we were still hungry. But um, there was a sense of hope here that, OK, we're not on our own. So the, you know, we, we stopped. Well, I would say we were hungry for a long time. We were hungry in many ways for things that we didn't really need, but that we had grown accustomed. We, so there were these sort of wants that we had. And I think some of us really haven't gotten over. It's almost like you know, um, some smokers who quit never get over the desire for that nicotine. There was so much about our food and the luxuries of that food that some of us have never really gotten over. And we kind of have stories about about the old days when we could get it. Um, but I would say that, you know, we were no longer worried about getting enough calories to eat um, once the train cars started showing up again. And the, the big deal here is that one of these grain hoppers can store 25,000 pounds of grain. And that's about enough to get, um, you know, a, almost a third of the county by each day. So you need like a probably about four of these hoppers a day to feed the county. And that, that wasn't really a problem. I mean, four, a, that's a pretty small train car. So it had to get distributed once it got here. Some challenges there. But as soon as we could get these hoppers around and they started coming, it was a big deal. And, uh, but of course, we had to then build the infrastructure in which to unload them. And it, it, it was a lot still. But other things could come on to these hoppers as well. You know, we weren't getting regular deliveries of, of diesel fuel for tractors. But once the hoppers were, once the, once the train were coming, we could. They could also provide the seeds and some of the equipment needed to start a local agricultural system that produced calorie crops like these potatoes. So this is a, uh, a picture of that first first year of potatoes, and this is sometime in the spring then of 2010. Um, and we were then planting potatoes in, in the valleys in, uh, in Mendocino County. And you all know um, that it's hard to keep your weight on eating just potatoes. There, It's a pretty bulky food, but it was kind of what we, one of the main subsistence foods we had for that year. We started becoming um, very aware of information that had been provided, for example, in um, this food security report that was produced in 2008. And it looked at, um, you know, what is it that people tend to eat? How much of what kind of products? And so this is, this is like a pie chart of how many calories you might eat in a day and what it's broken up into. And you see how important grains are, um, dry beans. So these became sort of an emphasis that the population really had to have these at a significant scale, and we had to have the equipment to produce them and to store them. Now, 
what we found um, during that, that the first you know, years in which we were learning how to do this for the first time <laughs> in generations was that there were serious limits with respect to our ability to pump water. You got to think about all the wells that are around um, and you see well houses, but they were not necessarily a bunch of solar panels or wind turbines around those well houses generating the, the electricity to run those, those well pumps. And so we were essentially thrown back to what you call dry land farming or dry land agriculture. And it would have helped a lot just to have a little bit of extra water. It's amazing how yields can improve just a, a significant amount with a small amount of water. And in a lot of cases, we couldn't get that water, even though we knew it was 30 feet down. Um, the other thing was that tractor fuel was really rationed. And we'll, so we found ourselves needing to do a lot more manual labor. So here we are. This is, this is again, that, um, that, that year, uh, 2010, the summer of 2010, of harvesting potatoes out of the fields. And you, see, you can see that people got out there and did it. Now, what's interesting is there was plenty of time to do this sort of work. And people were actually pleased to have something to do that was productive and that they knew they were, they were taking care of a problem. And, um, and so it wasn't all bad. It was very different. It, it was hard. It was physically challenging for, for us. But um, it actually was kind of fun for some people and exciting. Now, what we have now is in 2010, of course, there is this scramble going on among local government to figure out what to do. Um, people are saying, how do we let this happen? How are we going to make sure this doesn't happen again? And so what was interesting was that what became very important were, were sort of documents put together from county nonprofits and activist group. And here are just a couple examples from 2006 and, and 2007. And these became then the basis for scaling up a local food system to be uh, significant. Because before it had been sort of, you know, show up at farmers markets, what are called CSAs or community supported agricultural programs. And it was, it was growing, but, you know, if it's penetrating 2% of the county, it's, it's not really much of a factor yet in, uh, in, what, in how people are surviving. So it, we had to figure out a plan to scale that up so that most of what we needed we could produce locally. And it's sort of uncanny um, if you look back at, at this movement called the localization movement that began, you know, several years before the crisis hit, how well and clearly it was articulated our vulnerabilities. I mean, this is a graphic, uh, uh, an, an artistic rendition of sort of the problem that, we're, that we face, the, the vulnerabilities we have, related especially, you see, it's transportation inputs into Willits, um, oil, global shipping, um, trucking, et cetera, and food down here, the cheap, the cheap food that comes via this that is our, uh, our vulnerability. And then the alternative envisioned is let's have a local economy that runs on sunshine, knows how to cycle nutrients back to the soil, has a, has a basis in agriculture and renewable energy. And, um, and that, so that had been discussed for years preceding the crisis, but it really wasn't you know, taken seriously and implemented in a large extent until the crisis hit. Now, what's also interesting is the way we started rethinking um, sort of hum human presence on the land. And there's a, there's a concept called caring capacity, which any, any rancher knows. And basically, caring capacity, it, when, when ranchers talk about it, they call it stocking rate. It's, they look at how much grass is growing, how fast is it growing, how many animals can I put out on that field. And for the first time, it seems like ever, we had to think about caring capacity uh, for humans in the context of our county. And so um, we had to look at, for example, Mendocino County population in 2010 was about 80,000. And the, it became a policy to 
try to reduce that. And the reason why uh, that became understood as a need is because it takes about one acre of prime land, ag land to feed a person. And yet we only had somewhere around 30 to 50,000 acres of prime ag land in the county at the time. The bulk of it had been, had been paved over, built over, et cetera. And so it was also of interest to try to increase our prime ag land by re, re, um, reconstituting it as we could. And, but we knew that was going to be a slow process. And yet there were 80,000 people here. Um, so what's interesting is, is discussions like this had never even occurred or, uh, until, until it became absolutely necessary. So what, um, what we realized, of course, very early on was that we were missing all sorts of essential capital in this county. Like, you know, I gave some examples. We don't have the, we didn't have the renewable energy systems available for water. Um, we didn't have the, the harvesting and planting equipment for a lot of the basic food staples. There were not local food, fuel, and energy systems to run that equipment. Um, we didn't have storage facilities to store the major grains, for example. Uh, we didn't have educational systems in place for teaching young people useful trades. Uh, our, our retail outlets were reliant on vendors external to the county, and now they were forced to figure out how do we get our, st our shelves stocked from local products. And most of the land use decisions that had been made over the last decades had a low like, priority on sort of conservation and rehabilitation of agricultural lands. There had been loss every year was acceptable. So, um, and the mo one of the most interesting ones was, of course, the effective capture of human waste for recycling as fertilizer. It was illegal until um, after the crisis. So now I'm going to compare the food system in, uh, in 2009 with what we developed by 2020, okay? So in 2009, if you were to look at how many calories were available in the food that we, that we uh, got in America every year, in relation to how much energy went to it in, in, in caloric form, there were several times more ener energy calories going in than we got out. And a lot of this happened at the household level, but also a lot happened at the farm level. So there was a need in every step in the way to reduce our energy inputs to the food system. And this is a 2002 congressional report. And you can see the inputs in, agri in the agricultural sector. Fertilizers have a lot of fossil fuel in them. Of course, you know, diesel and gasoline, electricity. Um, when you dry foods, you use a lot of natural gas. So that had to be basically removed. Almost all the fossil fuel inputs had to be removed. And that, let me just look at this you know, graphically. You can, you can break up the type of work that you have to do in agriculture and the food system into many, many kinds and look at what were the fossil fuel inputs. And this, this table was in a 2008 report um, within, in Mendocino County. So tillage, for example, and farming requiring tractor's fuel. Then fertilizer usually is made with natural gas or mined fertilizers like phosphate rock. Pesticides and herbicides primarily derived from fossil fuel inputs, natural gas. And then the seed stocks, you know, seeds, the seed companies tend to be large and centralized and we had to get the seeds from them and they had to come from a long way. And then um, especially for fresh produce, you know, once it's harvested, uh, lettuce in the Salinas Valley, let's say, it gets trucked across New York City in about three days in a refrigerated truck. And then the packaging for things. There's more calories in the packaging than there is in that food, of course. And then when we go to a store and you look down the aisles and you see, you know, frozen dinners in, in giant refrigerated uh, uh, and, and freezers, huge amount of fossil fuel inputs there. And then, of course, we get in our, in our vehicle and uh, drive to the store to pick it up, go home, 
put it in a refrigerator and refrigeration is one of the largest uses of energy in most homes and then cook with it and usually people are cooking with a, a natural gas or propane or uh, maybe electricity with, a, with fossil fuels running the grid. So this, had, this of course had developed over decades and we thought it was genius because it seemed to provide us so much, so many choices, inexpensive and uh, but you know the hubris of Wile E. Coyote was, was quite apparent for all of us because pretty much in 2010 here's how we felt. So let's compare that to what we have today. Today we have a diverse agricultural system in this county. It's not dominated by, by uh, hay and livestock or grapes or just, just pears. Um, we actually think about a balanced diet being grown here. And then it's local. We're not thinking about how do we get a high-end product exported to the rest of the world so we can have the money to then buy other food from the rest of the world. It's more like the, the agricultural landscape serves the people who live here. It's renewable. Um, we think about every single energy input to the agricultural and food system and we make sure there's a renewable energy base to that. It's non-toxic. Since we're now living on this land in a different way, everyone's very concerned that that land doesn't get poisoned and that this food we're eating is, we're, you know, we don't like to, people don't like to see toxins getting sprayed on their food. Before you could ignore it because it was happening somewhere else. But um, now no one, no one accepts it. They don't want to see this stuff sprayed around them. So um, we have to think differently on how to manage pesticides and, or pests and, herb, or, and uh, weeds. It's cyclical. So because you can't just, um, you know, dump a bunch of fertilizer on your ground, you have to think about, farmers have to think about the cycles of soil building. And, and as they when they deplete, they have to rebuild those soils. It's adaptable. Climate shifts, um, we learn new things. So there's a lot of information exchange related to what works best. And it's buffered. We all know how uncertain the future is. And so we've set up a system that, that if we have a problem for a year or so, we are not in the lurch like we were the first time. And then um, this also was a graphic in one of the reports uh, before the crisis. And it looks then at kind of the, the, the web of connections that, you know, the, that the food system has with our land base, um, our forests, our water systems, and how this is linked with renewable energy. And of all, of, of course, the, the post-harvest processing, the manufacturing and maintenance of all the equipment needed, the movement around recycling waste so it goes back to our land. So this, this is like a web. And many of us now are involved somewhere along this in, in, our, in our jobs. Now, we still have fuel. Uh, it's not as as abundant as it was, we can't afford to waste it. And so we're not afraid anymore to use labor when it's, when it's efficient and effective. And, and, uh, and so a lot of, for example, our vegetable cultivation relies on, on labor. So there's a whole set of tools, like this is a broad fork. This is called a low wheel cultivator that make human labor very efficient. And they're totally different than what we saw in, you know, in, in uh, gardening stores before the crisis. The, all those things broke and we realized how cheap they were and how they were geared for hobbyists. But when we had to get serious about it, we had to start finding the right tools again and, and, and rebuilding them. Fertility. We no longer, of course, have, to have the fossil fuels. We can't just get a, a 20 ton truckload of compost and dump it wherever we want. We have to think about growing our own nitrogen with cover crops. We have to think about building our soil carbon stocks and organic matter by doing composting. Um, we have to take food scraps and put them in worm bins and get the, the mineral nutrients in that food back into a form that can be uh, uptaken again by plants. We have to get smart about how to manage the outbreaks of things like uh, cabbage moths and, and cucumber beetles. and so. We, we manage things in ways that actually um, enhance the beauty and pleasure that we take in, in, in the agricultural system. So you do you know, beneficial insect attractants. These are, these are plants that attract uh, parasitic wasps 
that will then attack the, uh, the pests that we're trying to uh, control. And then it's not just on the farm that has changed, of course. The consumers no longer expect to get plastic bags and, and full-scale disposable packaging whenever they show up to get their food. So we now have packaging that's reusable. And we also have families that are familiar with how to stick some meal or can in solar ovens. And of course, <clears throat> one of the most interesting transitions is with transportation. I mean, this, we became aware of this as a transportation problem when the trucks stopped showing up on December 12, 2009. And of course, to short circuit that, to not rely on that just-in-time delivery system, we had to localize then the production and consumption. So this is, this is a great contrast. So for example, that house in 2009, it would go to Safeway about a mile and a half away, and, but the, the food in Safeway was coming from maybe 1,500 miles away. Okay? But in 2020, that house is probably going to get its food from a local farm. And maybe that farm is even somewhere they can walk to. Okay? So a 150-yard diet as opposed to a 1,500-mile diet. This is orders and orders of magnitude um, more, more uh, energy efficient, of course. And it allows for our streets to be, you know, have fleets of bicycles rather than fleets of trucks. Much quieter, much safer for pedestrians, much less polluting. And, you know, we're all in actually a lot better physical shape because of it. Now, what's also interesting to think about is how the farms also have begun to look, um, look at each other as partners in this sort of landscape that we live in. And this is a great example. This is a goat dairy. And so you think, well, they just care about goats, right? Well, not at all. They have a choice of what they plant for a hay crop. They can plant a hay crop that includes a lot of wildflowers. Now, why would that be important? Well, that's important because there are local beekeepers. And one of our major sources of sweeteners is now local honey. We can't just decide that we're going to get a bunch of cane sugar from the tropics anymore. So we've had to really ramp up our beekeeping industry here. And they need to have these wildflowers. So why is that important also for our food? Because we don't no longer just rely on those bees for honey, but now we're also growing more row crops in the area. For example, winter squash. Every single winter squash that you eat has to be pollinated by a bee, and it has to happen on a single day. With a healthy bee population, you can get a high pollination rate on your winter squash, and they'll do well. Otherwise, you might be in trouble and you might have a crop failure. So a few miles away from this goat dairy, there are row crops that, that these bees can attend to. Now, what's interesting to think about is sort of the mixed feelings that we have now in 2020 about what we went through. There's, of course, a great deal of pride that we stepped up in the darkest of moments and made a, an amazing transition that nobody thought was possible for the crisis. You know, nobody really imagined that we would have to transition so quickly or that we even could transition so quickly. And, and so there's a lot of pride that we are able to come through this. But there's also a great deal of grief because we think, my gosh, the signs were so obvious why didn't we do anything ahead of time? It could have been a lot easier on us if we had taken advantage of the, all the free time we had, all the cheap energy and resources we had, and gotten our act together well ahead of, this, of the crisis. And, and so there's still this sort of the sense of, of sadness and sometimes bitterness and regret mixed with the fact that we have done some great things and we are, in general, healthier than we have ever been. So, <clears throat> this is Leadership Mendocino I'm talking to. So, I want to end by giving some thoughts about what, what this teaches us about leadership. And so, you've seen a lot about how 
um, there were so many signs and so many you know, warnings about this. And it was hard to find somebody in 2008 that if you talked to didn't realize that these problems were, 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 were there. But it was much harder to find anybody who was doing anything about it. And so <clears throat> the, one of the problems is that we live in this sort of social matrix in which the conversations we're having tend to perpetuate themselves. And if we have a set of conversations that dominates, um, it's very hard to insert a new conversation in there. It just, it does not, people don't have the time. And, and, and so what's really important is that to avert a crisis, the, a reality-based conversation has to get inserted somehow ahead of it. Because like we saw, just because certain people are storing food and preparing for this doesn't mean that's doing enough. All right, those people probably wish they had done more work with their neighbors, getting, helping them get prepared. And because then there would have been more food to go around when the crisis did hit. The other thing we have to think about is that <clears throat> we saw in 2008 and 2009 that many of the solutions that were being proposed for the financial crisis at the time were perpetuating the deeper problem. We had a system in which we had run up huge debts and we had you know, developed a whole lot of debt related to industries that were going bankrupt. And yet a lot of what we were doing was trying to prop them up, trying to prop up large financial institutions, trying to prop up fossil fuel consuming manufacturing industries. So <clears throat> the problem is that a lot of solutions proposed perpetuated the deeper problem. And so what's difficult is that real solutions may often be the opposite of the short-term rewards that the current system promotes. And people in a crisis can sometimes get into this, like, I've got to, I got to do something, I got to do something, as opposed to under, uh, sitting back and understanding what the real deeper issues are. And so those of us who are leaders and are ahead of the curve, you know, your hope, your best hope is to act responsibly and cultivate social reinforcement of these new conversations and behaviors that get ahead of the problem. Now, <clears throat> so that's to try to avert a crisis. The scary thing is, if you look at human history, one civilization after another has found itself in the situation we were in, in which afterwards we look back and said, oh my gosh, that was obvious, you know. Why were we so dumb? So um, there's no, you know, there's no, there's no uh, guarantee. In fact, it's highly likely that we won't take care of this problem ahead of time. And so <clears throat> during a crisis, it's very important that you adopt what, what I call the survivor's attitude. And this is uh, Shackleton. And they had, a, they had a trip down to the South Pole. Um, and it, it was a mess. They got locked up in ice. They had to abandon, um, they had to abandon basically their ship as it got crushed and sunk. And they spent a year and a half in little rowboats uh, dragging them across the ice. Now, so normalcy has just disappeared. And people are at a loss. What does a good leader do? The good leader has been ready to some extent for this eventuality. Not just, you know, they can't be ready necessarily physically, but they can be ready mentally. And it's hard to predict who is going to be good at this. But Shackleton was able to keep his cool, not let the emotions overwhelm him, and think clearly in the time of crisis. And, and that attitude, that ability, is what gets people through these things. And nobody on Shackleton's crew died as a result of a year and a half lost on the ice in Antarctica. And so this was what was key also during our crisis here, was that it was because people had prepared ahead of time, even though it was a small fraction of the population, and had thought through the issues enough, that when the rest of the population was in a panic mode, at a loss, they could say, look, here's what has to be done. We've thought about this before. Let's go. So thank you very much. and. It's a great pleasure being here at Leadership Mendocino, and I, I want all of you to, uh, 
take these problems seriously and not let them happen.